Daniel, welcome. I'm so excited to be here with you, Jason. We are so excited you're here. One of our favorite authors and a pioneer in the field of brain health. It's an honor. Thank you. So one of the things I found fascinating in your work is apparently there are five different brain types. Can you explain? Can we start there? Well, you know, when I first started scanning people in 1991, the first thing I learned is that everybody's different. Uh, like all depression's not the same, all addicts are not the same, all people who are overweight are not the same, that there are different types. And so balanced is the first type. It's where their brain really actually works pretty healthy. It's not the most people. Um, and then there are people that are spontaneous, think of impulsive. There are people who are persistent, compulsive. There are people who are sad or sensitive, and there are people who are cautious or anxious. And then you can have a combination of those types. But those are the five primary types, balanced, spontaneous, persistent, sensitive, and cautious. And knowing your type goes with, well, what kind of diet should you have? Mm -hmm. What are the right supplements for you? And if you got sad or you got really anxious, what's the right treatment for the individual brain rather than one treatment or one program fits everybody. And how does the population split across the five types? If you had to venture a guess. So very high and more than 40 years ago when I became a psychiatrist are a lot more spontaneous types. Um, the incidence, for example, of ADD has quadrupled since the 1980s. Wow. And I think part of that is all of the gadgets, our bad diet, uh, commercials, you know, they'd have one scene that would be three seconds, and now it's one second. <laughs> and so um, technology is really decreasing our attention span. Um, the second most common is the cautious type. Anxiety has skyrocketed in our society, um, in part because of the bombardment of negative news that clickbait is generally not positive. <laughs> clickbait is almost always negative because the brain is historically wired to pay attention to what's wrong rather than what's right because it's a survival mechanism. But now that you have the internet and advertisers, they're going after what makes you afraid. And so we have a higher incidence of anxiety than ever before. So anxiety, you nailed it, so pervasive. What's happening there in the brain? Well, in the brain, the brain has memory. And so if you're constantly bombarded by what could go wrong, then your brain remembers that and it begins to predict that things are not going to turn out well, which drives anxiety. And there's nowhere in school where people teach you to not believe every stupid thing you think. Mm -hmm. And so in Change Your Brain, Change Your Grades, and actually in most of my books, I talk about ants, automatic negative thoughts, and the, the need to think honestly. So notice I didn't say positively, because positive thinking is I can have these three pieces of cheesecake and they won't hurt me. Um, <laughs> I, I want people to be conscientious and honest. And so the little tiny habit, I talk a lot about what's the smallest thing I can do today that'll make the biggest difference, is whenever you feel sad or mad or nervous or anxious or out of control, write down what you're thinking and just ask yourself whether or not it's true. If you can absolutely know that thing is true. So learning how to talk back to your own thoughts. Uh, many of us, me in particular, I was really good at talking back to my parents when I was a teenager, but no one ever taught me I should really be talking back to myself and not just believe the nonsense that I, I think sometimes. So how much of anxiety today do you think is lifestyle induced rather than I'm just got some wiring I'm born with and it's difficult? I think a lot of the anxiety today is due to our lifestyle and also our nutrient deficiencies. 
So it's like 80% of the population is low in magnesium. Magnesium is just such a wonderful anti-anxiety nutrient. And so get your magnesium right and you're going to feel better. Um, and then learn how to not believe every dumb thing you think you will feel better. And in second grade, they should have taught you how to do diaphragmatic breathing. And there's this one pattern, three seconds in, six seconds mm -hmm. out. If you double your exhalation time, it actually triggers an automatic relaxation response. I mean, this is stuff that really we should be teaching kids. We have a high school course called Brain Thrive by 25, where we teach kids not to believe every stupid thing they think, how to eat for their brain, and how to do these simple relaxation exercises. So you mentioned eating for your brain. What are the base? I know it's hard to generalize. We're all individuals, but if you, if you had to generalize, what are some of the, the best foods, the best nutrients that we should be having to eat for optimal brain health? So I have this little tiny habit, another one. Um, whenever you go to make a decision, especially about food, just ask yourself, it's three seconds. Is this good for my brain or bad for it? And and most people actually will get the list pretty right. You know, in second grade, I went to my daughter's second grade class and I put 20 things on the board and I'm like, good for your brain or bad for you. And they got everything right except orange juice because they put that in the healthy category. And, you know, then I had 10 oranges. It took to make one glass of orange juice. It's like, is it ever rational really to have that much sugar? And it's absolutely not. And so I'm a fan of fruit, um, but not juice, because whenever you unwrap fruit from its fiber source, it tends to turn toxic in your liver. So colorful fruits and vegetables, because they have the most antioxidants, high quality, clean protein, your brain needs protein in order to function properly. Um, healthy fat, it's the one thing, um, when I was in medical school, they began talking about low fat diets. And as we took fat out of our diets, obesity skyrocketed because they replaced fat with sugar. Um, low or no sugar, I'm a huge fan of, and I'm a fan of avoiding things or at least limiting things that quickly turn to sugar, bread, hmm. pasta, potatoes, rice. Um, think of them like condiments rather than the main part of the meal. So if you think of a plate, 70% of it, plant-based foods, 30% high quality for pro protein, and then mix in a healthy fat, and you have a really good brain healthy diet filled with the nutrients you need. Now, if you're spontaneous or impulsive people, they actually do really well with a higher protein, lower simple carbohydrate diet. The, they do well on a ketogenic diet. You put the, the um, persistent people on a ketogenic diet, they get mean because they start thinking about the things. So then they go on Twitter. Then they go on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and especially you should not be on Twitter if you haven't slept. So those people that are sleeping four hours a night, thinking of one person in particular, it's like, no, that's the wrong time to be tweeting. <laughs> so specific to food, I'm curious, we talked about uh, clean protein, uh, healthy fats. What are some of your favorites? Avocados, uh, huge fan of avocados, wild salmon, I'm another fan, um, flax seeds, chia seeds. I'm really a fan of nuts and seeds, except I also think, and I don't, not everybody agrees with me, but I'm pretty clear that you need to be calorie smart. When 70% of the population is overweight and 40% of us are obese, calories really do matter. And of course, the quality of them matters more, right? I mean, if you had an 800 calorie a day Twinkie diet um, versus 1200 calorie a day, vegetable diet one's going to make you they'll both make you lose weight but one will make you sick right. and so the quality and the quantity really do matter so you mentioned twi twinkies what are some of the worst foods for her brain there's this fascinating study from australia 
where they looked at two outer islands. One had fast food, the other did not. The island with fast food restaurants, the population had significantly lower levels of omega-3 fatty acids and five times the level of depression. So wow. I think we should really reconsider all the processed foods that we eat that are laden with corn and soy, which are very high in omega-6 fatty acids, mm -hmm. which are pro-inflammatory, and um, sugar, artificial dyes, sweeteners. Uh, we just have to be really thoughtful, really careful with those I have a new book coming out next year. I hope you interview me for it. It's called The End of Mental Illness. You can come back anytime. Just, I, I, could do, I could talk to you for like 10 hours. I know we're short. we don't have that much time today. But in The End of Mental Illness, I have this writing device I really love. It's called If I Was an Evil Ruler. And I wanted to create mental illness in America. What would I do? I'd basically create our food supply. I would create all the fast food restaurants and processed and packaged foods because they're killing us. Um, we need to be much more thoughtful. I know you believe this uh, about our food. So I have two young children. I have a two and a half year old and a three month old, which will explain my lack of sleep today. Uh, and you've got this fantastic new book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Grades. They don't have grades yet, but we're talking about kids, the future. How do we ensure that our children have healthy brains. So the number one thing you can do is model it. It's the most important thing. If you and their mother model a brain healthy life, they're going to see that as normal. And yes, if they go to preschool and people are teaching them to count with candy corn, it's insane. Um, they're going to be upset about that. But if you live the message, you can then give the message, uh, which I think is just so important. And then the food you feed them early really does matter because, again, back to the evil ruler, happy meals are a weapon of mass destruction because you're shaping their palate with processed foods that are really not good for them and they can get addicted to yellow things like, you know, mac and cheese and grilled sure. cheese sandwiches and french fries and things that are not really serving brain development. So what are, I, I have a friend who, who uh, puts cod liver oil and she was sneaking into her, her daughter's whatever she was having. I was like, that's brilliant. Like, what are your thoughts about if, if we're going to try to get our, our, our little ones to really get exposed to a couple great foods that are really phenomenal for, for growing a healthy brain at a young age? Like, what are those? So my wife has a recipe. She has a cookbook called Brain Warrior's Way Cookbook. Uh, brain Warrior, because we believe you're in a war for the health of your brain. And she has an avocado gelato recipe that <laughs> tastes so good. My grandson, I have five grandbabies, and uh, he, he was just a super picky eater and driving his mom crazy. And when he came over and he got avocado gelato, it was just all over his face. It was so cool. So a little bit of cocoa is good as long as there's not a whole bunch of sugar and yep. dairy in it. Uh, avocados, I'm a huge fan of fish. Uh, so if you can give it to them when they're young and help them develop a taste for it, it is really good. The countries that eat the most fish have the lowest incidence of depression because of the omega-3 fatty acids in there. Um, when they're teething, it's really okay to give them a carrot or cucumber you know, something that just begins to train their brain to like it and not need a lollipop mm -hmm. uh, that has artificial dyes and sugar. Um, just, just some of the things that are just simple and thoughtful. Eggs still good for kids? Eggs are great. Okay. I'm a huge fan of eggs. And, and I'm a huge fan of, of nuts for kids, and they often love it. Uh, too often parents go to what's easy, the processed and packaged foods. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's easy. So it's a short term fix that causes a long term problem. What are your favorite nuts? Oh, I like pistachio. Oh, that makes, we could just stop there. That's my favorite. You made my day. <laughs>
<laughs> so walnuts are also awesome as well. What uh, cashews? Um, some people are more sensitive. There's some evidence it may not be as good for your yes. gut lining. Sorry, Doctor Gundry. <laughs> Um, any other nuts? Brazil nuts, yep. actually higher yeah. in omega-3s. So other, uh, uh, drilling down on like food and, and what we put into our bodies, alcohol. Not a fan. Um, Full stop. Um, just not a fan. When you think of the empty calories uh, that when people drink, their decisions aren't quite as good. Um, I've seen a whole bunch of issues with domestic violence uh, related to alcohol. Um, my wife's a nurse. And why do nurses put alcohol on your skin before they give you a shot? Because it sterilizes the mm -hmm. area, it decreases the bugs on your skin. Well, how many bugs do you have in your gut? You have a hundred trillion. And is drinking a lot really good for your microbiome? And the answer is no, it's not. Plus, alcohol is directly related to seven different kinds of cancer. And we go, oh, alcohol is good for your heart. Well, clearly it's not good for your brain. There's a study from Johns Hopkins that showed people who drink every day have a smaller brain. How much and are they drinking though? Um, no, it wasn't much. Got like for women, it was like one glass a day. And for men, it was two glasses a day. So well considered into what's acceptable. And they had smaller brain. And uh, I've done the w more brain scans related to mental health than anybody in the history of the world. We have 160,000 scans. Wow. And the alcohol scans, it prematurely ages your brain. And marijuana was actually worse, which surprised me, but it clearly was not making your brain younger and healthier. So I want to go to marijuana, but just to clarify, so for alcohol, you're not even a fan of moderation. So like not a, not a glass of red wine or rosé or just... You know, if you have two glasses a week, it's probably no big deal. Got it. If you have two glasses a day, you're going to have Too a smaller much. brain. Okay, that's fair. Um, marijuana something a lot of people have uh, an opinion on on what's good for us and not good for us there publicly i've said i am not a fan and something that concerns me and and you know the data more than i do but what i've seen and read is especially for the developing brain anecdotally i've seen it with friends can be really damaging well in a replicated study from norway Marijuana among teenagers increases the risk of psychosis 450%. Wow. New study. People who smoke pot as teenagers, as young adults, have a higher incidence of anxiety, depression, and suicide. And so I looked at it. Um, marijuana is very common among our patients. So I got a thousand of them. And then I compared the marijuana brains to healthy virtually every area of the brain was lower in blood flow and activity. That's a bad thing. And then last year I published the world's largest imaging study on 62,454 scans, looking at how the brain ages and little kids, like your little kids, they have very busy brains because they're going through things like myelination and pruning. And, you know, they're just kids have wildly busy brains. And as we age, like I turned 65 this year, the older you get, the sleepier your brain sure. gets. And so I published the patterns and then I looked, well, what accelerated aging? And schizophrenia was actually the worst. It accelerated aging a lot. But the second worst was marijuana. People who'd use marijuana. Now, smoking was there and alcohol was there and having bipolar and ADHD were there. But for it to be the second most potent accelerator of aging, I'm just not a fan. And then, you know, probably like you, I have many friends who've smoked pot for a long time and their brains look terrible. Well, what's also, I would say, alarming at the moment is it seems like we're opening the floodgates there. And, and you know, and, and, and I'm of two minds on this. Uh, I also do a podcast called the Brain Warriors Way podcast. And my wife is really clear that she's very unhappy about the legalization of marijuana. And I'm like, please don't put 
people smoke marijuana in jail. That is the dumbest thing to Agreed. Yeah. put them in a cage yeah. and sleep deprive them and give them bad food and let them hang out with people who do bad things. Like that's not a good idea. But let's not say it's good for you because it's not good for you. Um, and as the perception of dangerousness of a drug goes down, its use goes up. Now, I'm a huge fan. When my father-in-law died of um, pancreatic cancer, sure. you know, I would go get it for him because it decreased his pain and it helped him eat. You know, is marijuana really worse than alcohol? Um, you know, probably not that worse. Um, is it really worse than Xanax? Uh, some of the benzodiazepines we use for anxiety. You know, probably not. But neither of them are good for you just because one is bad, you know. I mean, you don't have to go and do the comparison thing. They're both bad. What are some of the things you can deal to deal with anxiety besides marijuana? And there's like a dozen things. What are some of those things? And, and on marijuana, on that, uh, well, we're sticking to the plan, but talk about hemp and CBD and the endocannabinoid system. So CBD, in my mind, the jury's out because it's been legal for such a short period of time. There are good, no long-term studies on it. And the problem is there's so many supplement companies making insane amounts of money with this. They didn't really want to publish the studies because it's like the perception now is that it's not psychoactive. Although if it's not psychoactive, why does it work for anxiety, right? I mean, that sort of doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it's like, oh, it's completely safe. And I'm not sure that that's the case. You know, cocaine actually used to be in Coca-Cola sure. because we thought it was innocuous and clearly it's not. Got it. In terms of, let's talk about supplements for a moment. You mentioned magnesium. We talked about CBD. What are other some good catch-alls that are generally good for brain health? So with your children, I would actually give them fish oil in whatever you know way that they can tolerate you know okay. there are a couple of companies like barleen's makes a omega swirl that is really great um so i think um, a good multiple vitamin i actually make a chewable multiple vitamin um it's in the shape of a little penguin there's a whole story behind the penguin <laughs> um, but there's no sugar in it you know mostly when you look at kids uh, nutrients yeah. they're loaded with artificial dyes sweeteners and sugar and so kids neurovite is ours and there's nothing like that there's no i call them brand violations um, so multiple vitamin omega-3 fatty acids and then look at their vitamin D level mm -hmm. because vitamin D deficiencies are rampant in our society in part because the dermatologists won. They made us afraid of the sun. And, but we evolved or we were made in the sun and low levels of omega, of vitamin D it's a universal risk factor. In fact, those people who have a level, normals between 30 and 100, um, if you're over 40, you have half the risk of cancer as someone who's under 20. And it's like, wow, and that's like so simple to either get more sun, obviously in a right. safe way, or to take a vitamin D3 supplement. So for me, multiple vitamin fish oil, optimize your vitamin D level, and then it depends on what's your brain type. Right. If you're spontaneous, you do, thing, you do better with things that increase blood flow, like rhodiola, ashwagandha, ginseng, green tea without the caffeine. If you're the persistent type, you need more serotonin. And one of my favorite supplements is saffron. It's mm. super safe, and it has about 20 studies showing it has antidepressant qualities. Um, it also has been shown to help with memory. So, I mean, like, that's an awesome supplement. For the sensitive people, I like Sammy. I'm a huge fan of Sammy for them. It yeah. helps decrease pain, but also increase your mood. For the cautious people, I like GABA, mm -hmm. theanine, and magnesium. Good sleep formula. <laughs> so you mentioned caffeine, coffee. 
How much? Good, so I'm bad. actually friends with Dave Asprey. This is our, <laughs> I scanned him like 13 years ago. His brain looked terrible. And then we scanned him um, two years ago. And his brain looked so much wow, better. I have to do and this scan. I love him. Um, but we part ways on caffeine because, you know, he has a caffeine company. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, you know, the largest drug dealer in the United States is Starbucks. Uh, so when Howard Schultz was running for president, I'm like, you know, I don't think I want the Starbucks label on the White House. But um, I'm not a fan. So why am I not a fan? Uh, caffeine constricts blood flow. It actually prematurely ages the brain. And people get dependent on it. Uh, I have, you know, this patient I dearly love and we spent the last couple of months getting her off caffeine because when people with ADD use stimulants, and I'm not opposed to stimulants for people with ADD, but if they do that with caffeine, the stimulants don't work quite as well because they compete for the same receptor sites in the brain. Plus, I, I can't tell you, anyone I've gotten off of caffeine has regretted it. They always say, over time, their energy is better and their sleep is better. But if I was an evil ruler, I would create a culture where we start the morning with caffeine to have energy and then end the day with alcohol. And I think getting rid of both of them, your sleep is better, your energy is better, and you don't have to live in an artificial existence of energy. Do you drink coffee at all? Um, a little bit, but mostly decaf. I make my wife, this is how I tell her I love her every morning, is she came up with a pumpkin spice almond milk latte. And so think of um, unsweetened almond milk with decaf coffee, um, pumpkin spice with a little bit of, I like this company called Sweet Leaf. They make like sure. 10 different flavors. So we put in pumpkin and chocolate stevia put it in a blender, it frosts like crazy, and it tastes amazing. So I, I am not in the Dave Asprey camp where I put anything in my coffee, but I have black. I love black coffee, so I, I will have to do one, the scan at some point <laughs> to see w what's happening. I love black coffee. Uh, but, but does it love you back? And it's, so, when it's an idea I've thought about <laughs> for a long time over the last couple of years. It's like, you know, I love Rocky Road ice cream, but it doesn't love me back. I love spaghetti, but it doesn't so love I'm, me back. So I, I don't know if this is a brain type or it has to do with metabolism, but I don't do this, but I could drink a cup of coffee at nine o'clock at night and not have any problem falling asleep. I don't do it often, but if I, I have done it and... So you're a fast metabolizer. Yeah. And... Um, you know, it's it's not the end of the world. And, you know, I don't like it because of the vasoconstriction that often it mm -hmm. causes. But people who drink the most coffee have the lowest incidence of Parkinson's and diabetes. So I also understand the research. Sure. Um, so it may not be the devil, but it probably doesn't make your brain look prettier. Got it. I, ha I will do the scan. Now I'm convinced. Uh, two things we, we sort of talked about very briefly keto intermittent fasting good bad jury's out so i have a granddaughter that has a seizure disorder and i love her dearly and on the ketogenic diet her seizures virtually went away wow so for people with certain brain types uh the ketogenic diet can be really great for them and you know the one thing the ketogenic diet does is it gets rid of all of the crappy carbohydrates that are killing us in this country. I don't really like it overall because there's not enough colorful plants. And colorful plants have medicine in them. Um, I'm a huge fan of intermittent fasting. I actually try to do it every day to try to go between 12 and 16 hours between meals because it's been shown to clean uh, the synapses in the brain, that it actually helps to break up beta amyloid plaques thought to be involved in Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. And it's also a way that really helps people manage their weight. So how do we know if our brain's healthy? You're not going to your regular doctor and you're doing your blood work. like. I 
is it is it the scan or like in, what isn't that insane right yeah. when i turned 50 my doctor uh -huh. wanted me to have a colonoscopy i asked him why he didn't want to look at my brain wasn't the other end just <laughs> as important <laughs> <laughs> but we don't screen it right we screen hearts and we screen prostates and cervix and breasts um why aren't we screening the most important organ? And SPECT, the study we do, is a great screening tool because I can tell 20 years before you're going to get Alzheimer's disease whether or not you're headed to the dark place. And some of my you know, critics will go, well, why would you want to know? Because there's right. nothing you can do about it. Right. And I'm like, there's all sorts of things you can do about it. I mean, if you knew a train was going to hit you, wouldn't you at least want to try to get out of the way? But a long time ago, I realized not everybody can get a scan. So based on thousands of scans, I developed a questionnaire. Um, people can take it. It's free, brainhealthassessment.com, brainhealthassessment.com. It'll tell you which of the 16 brain types you have. So it's those five primary types plus combinations. Um, and then, well, how's your memory? How's your focus? How's your energy? How's your sleep? And it'll give you a brain health score as well. So that's one another way um, that's free and simple. So you mentioned sleep. I am sleep deprived at the moment, and that's because I have a three month old. The importance of sleep and brain health. So a long time ago, I realized if you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, if it's headed to the dark place, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. And I created this mnemonic called Bright Minds, um, like B is for blood flow, R is retirement and aging, S is for sleep. Sleep is absolutely essential for your brain to work right. And there's a study on soldiers who got seven hours of sleep were 98% accurate on the range. Those who only got six hours of sleep were 50% accurate on the range. Wow. And those who only got four hours of sleep were dangerous. They were only 15% accurate on the range. So when you sleep, your brain cleans or washes itself. It's actually brand new research over the last couple of years. They thought there was no lymphatic system in the brain. And the reason they thought that is it only turns on when you sleep. So when they actually looked at people awake and then asleep, they could see, well, that's when the cleaning crew comes and cleans <laughs> up all the junk that builds up during the day. So if you're sleep deprived, you don't want to be driving. You don't want to be making big business decisions and you don't want to have a fight with your wife because she's sleep deprived too. Um, you just want to give yourself and other people in your life a little bit more grace and then try to catch up. So you mentioned some of the latest research where do you think science is going right now? What are we going to be talking about a year from now, two years? What do you think is really exciting? So when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, space was the new frontier. Now it's the space between your ears. I think neuroscience is just going to explode. And we're, we're not going after, it's not going to be a pill that cures Alzheimer's disease. It's going to be your diet. It's going to be your lifestyle. Um, it's a fascinating study out of Finland where they put people, it was cognitive training, exercise, and a healthy diet like the one we talked about, significant improvement in people who had memory problems. So I think uh, this idea of our lifestyle um, impact on the brain. And my hope where we go in the future, it's why I wrote the end of mental illness. We're going to stop calling these things mental illnesses and call them what they really are. Brain health issues that steal your mind. Mm. So you are a prolific New York times bestselling author, and you've got another book, change your brain, change your grades. Why this book? Why is it so critical? I love this book because I was not a good student in high school and I was a great student in college. And I took time to actually think about why. And it was really my approach to things like teachers and studying and tests. And one tip in there that is so important is read what they're gonna talk about in class before 
you go to class. Because if you do that, it will reinforce the information, plus you'll ask smart questions and the teachers will think you're smart. <laughs> and if you mix that with brain health, because what's the organ of learning? It's your brain. And with our habits being so poor today, if you can really get your brain habits right and you know the right approach to take to school, you'll improve a whole letter grade. So I'm pretty excited. And for me, the, the most fun part of this book was I wrote it with my daughter and my niece, um, in part because I really wanted them to get the information I know. And so if they're my co-authors, they obviously have to read and comment on everything. <laughs> Plus I hadn't been in school in 40 years and I needed them to tell me what's the new technology that helps. So we covered a lot of ground today. What's one takeaway you want to leave with people who are, who are saying to themselves, okay, I'm in, I need to start taking care of my brain in a better way. What do you want to leave them with? The most exciting lesson of my work is you're not stuck with the brain you have, that you can make it better and I can prove it. So I did the big NFL study. When the NFL was lying, they had a problem. We <laughs> scanned and treated 300 uh, active and retired football players and some wonderful Hall of Fame players. And in as little as two months, we could improve their brain if we put them on the right program multiple vitamin, fish oil, supplements that boost their brain, avoid things that hurt it, do things that help it. And a long time ago, I horrified myself because I went, oh, you can summarize all of your work in three words, um, care. You have to start caring about your brain. When you see it, you will always treat it better because you've seen it. Um, care about it. Stop doing things that hurt it and do things that help it. And you just have to know the less. On the subject of football, something my wife and I have talked about, we've said, is football going to exist in 20 to 30 years? Or is it just so ingrained in our culture? But what's your take on what you're seeing with the brain scans? And there have been some pretty mind blowing personal stories of what's happened to players. And playing football for a developing brain is bad. There's no way to get around it. Your brain is soft, about the consistency of soft butter. Your skull is really hard, and the skull has sharp, bony ridges. Uh, the brain floats in water with those sharp ridges. You don't have to lose consciousness to have a bad brain injury. The thousands of subconcussive blows, it's just dumb for, for children. And uh, one of my friends said, but my son really wants to play. And I said, well, what if he really wanted to do cocaine? Would you go get him a dealer? I mean, that's insane. God gave you parents to be your child's frontal lobes until their frontal lobes develop. I don't think football's going away. Politically, it's too powerful, but it's gonna become a ghetto sport. And I hate that because the moms who really are educated, who are thinking about it, are gonna like go tennis, golf table tennis, dance, um, track. I mean, there are all sorts of things you can do for exercise and team sports that don't damage the brain. But other people who are not really thinking about it as much are gonna let their kids play. So, you know, the NFL owns a day of the week, but it's, uh, it's changing and our society is changing. And if I was a good ruler, the one strategy that I would employ is create a nationwide program in brain health, because ultimately the end of mental illness is going to begin with a revolution in brain health. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks.